I want her to come here, Casey. Yeah. I'll just have the employee come here at uh, Wood Nine work. Nobody is posting corners. I'm gonna put that back. That's why I was like, okay, clearly somebody's gonna know the name. Where's my YouTube up so you can see the question? Why? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Linda. Sorry. Like the third link down. <laughs> I think Monica was gonna Welcome everyone to the morning session of the ARP ESSER uh, implementation form, uh, uh, forum. Um, want to thank you for all of your early morning rises. Uh, it's uh, early morning for me, so <laughs> and the folks with me, I'm, I'm sure not, but um, we intend to present some, uh, an overview, a quick overview of what's going on. We're talking about in excess of $14 million so it's in, uh, important that we have the public input uh, and you know, determine what is in the best interest of our students as we move forward with this federal money. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, the people with me here at the table. Starting to my far left will be uh, Linda Carter, who is our, our grants director, okay, Superintendent McGovern, um, our S chief financial officer, Mr. Scott Duncan, our assistant superintendent in HR is Nicole Bolton. Uh, to my right is Casey Arnoldi, who is the special education director. Jody Garner, who is the uh, curriculum director. And on my far right is Stephanie Tolman, our, our director of um, technology. So with that, and I believe we have Mr. Mickelson as another, are there any other trustees on? Okay, so we have Mr. Mickelson virtually uh, as a trustee. Uh, I am Carol Jellico. I am the chair of the board here. So I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent McGovern as we start to give you an overview of, of the plan. 
Well, good morning, Sweetwater County. Uh, welcome to Monday morning, November 15th. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. I um, echo the gratitude of everyone being here this morning and also just to gather the information that we've got. Um, the first thing, we'd like to give you an overview of the process for the American Rescue Plan, the ESSER dollars that Sweetwater Number 1 um, is slated to receive. Uh, Chair Jellico mentioned that it's approximately $14.2 million, and we want to make sure that we have short-term goals and then also long-term goals for the use of the funds. I think first and foremost, perhaps, Zach, maybe we put up the timeline of just the different activities that the district is doing um, to allow for public input on this as the perspective of many people are going to be very essential. Um, we're also going to um, be asking our students. We've sent out one student square a little bit, but we're going to detail that a little bit more so we can hear from our, our kids as to what the things that they need. The overall purpose for the funds, they're called ARP funds, is really to um, address the needs of the pandemic so that we can continue with in-person learning as much as possible as the future of it is a little bit uncertain for us. And then also um, the best way to meet the needs as far as learning for our students, resources for our staff, including our administration, and then also as we move forward. So knowing that's the big picture for the use of the funds, um, what Zach is showing right now is the timeline that the district is using to kind of follow through with different steps to make sure we meet the requirements of the grant. And the first part of the grant, and we'll go into that a little bit more um, in just a few, is about a safe return to in-person. And what, like I said, we'll talk about some details for that one here in just a second. And then the second part is really the implementation or the spending plan for how we use those funds, not only to um, support us as we move through the pandemic, but also post-pandemic and how we make sure we do what's right for our community and our kids inside. In that timeline, actually, we've worked our way through. Um, we know we've had lots of communication going out to our community about the different steps, and we'll go into that a little bit more, but we're actually in the timeline. We're on that uh, third page for that, and it's the section, Zach, that was um, up there on the pink part this morning where we're holding the forum so our community has another opportunity to provide input. And from there, after we get that, uh, then we'll go ahead and we'll propose a draft plan for the use of funds. And then um, that will also go out for public feedback as your input is important to make sure we have the best use for that. And then we would like to bring that to the board in the December board meeting, uh, which actually is um, the, what date are we? the 13th of um, December, and then we'll actually have both parts of the plan. I think a good overview to get us going this morning might be to show a video real quick. It's short. It's only five minutes in length that details all of the steps for the grant process that's so important for the district to follow. Good morning, Sweetwater One community. I'm Kelly McGovern. I'm the superintendent of schools, and we're doing a video this morning to share the process with you on some grant funds that are available to the district. The grant is called the American Rescue Plan, ARP, or ESSER grant, and the allocation for Sweetwater One is approximately $14.2 million. And we'd like to ask for your feedback or proposals on the best way to use the funds to really meet the needs of our students and for our staff as we work through the pandemic. There's essentially two plans that are required for the ARP grant. And the first one is called a safe return and continuity plan. 
And we'll share some specifics about that one here shortly. But basically, it's what we're doing to make sure we have in-person instruction every day and as much as possible. The second plan is called the ARP implementation or the spending plan. And that's where your feedback and your input are gonna be so valuable on the best use of these resources. So we're gonna shift it over to Nicole and we're gonna share with you a little bit of information. And then Stephanie will talk to you about how do you submit that feedback. So thanks for being involved and we look forward to hearing um, your great ideas. Hello, I'm Nicole Bolton and I'm the Human Resource Director for Sweetwater School District Number 1. Previously, Superintendent McGovern had mentioned our safe return plan in order to receive these funds. I just wanted to take a moment to go over our safe return plan. All the safe return plan encompasses are our current practices and expectations that the district is taking in order to keep our schools open. At this time, we have no intent of changing any of those practices, but they were a requirement in order for us to apply for the funds. Hello, my name is Stephanie Tolman. I'm the Chief Information Officer for Sweetwater County School District Number 1, and I wanted to take a few moments to walk you through the form that you'll use to submit feedback or a proposal in order to help us plan the spending of the ARP funds. If you could please bring up the form. So as you see here, this link will be posted to our website and it will bring you to the form to submit your information. As you go through, we're gonna ask for your first and last name. We're gonna ask who you represent. And in my case, I would be an employee, but you'll notice that we're looking for feedback from parents, students, community members, or even business partners. Um, the next question, you'll indicate if you're submitting a proposal or a feedback. For a feedback, that's just going to give you an opportunity to, to type out kind of your thoughts on the funds or your thoughts on how the district should use these funds moving forward. In this case, we're going to go with a proposal. Here you'll be able to upload a proposal um, with your ideas on how we could use the funds. Staff could submit, submit ideas that they have for maybe different resources or programs or training that we could use to help with our students. As you go down, you'll notice that there are the allowable expenses for the, the funds. So you'll go through and read these. And what we need you to do is make sure that you check what your proposal meets. And you can do multiple options on this. So these are some of the requirements that we need to submit in order to be able to apply for the funds. The proposals have to meet one or more of these requirements. And keep in mind that 20% of the funds actually have to be used to address learning loss for students due to COVID. So read through those options, select what applies to your funds. For staff members, you'll notice at the end that it's gonna ask if you have notified your immediate supervisor of your proposal, because we wanna make sure that they're in the loop in order to be able to help best support you and your students. We strongly encourage you to go and provide information. Remember the deadline ends November 30th at 4 p.m. So get your ideas to us so we can start the next phase of applying for these funds and meeting the needs of our students. Thank you. And as we finish up this video for you, the timeline to submit either feedback or a proposal is it starts today, November 9th, and it goes through November 30th. The window closes November 30th at four o'clock. So all ideas are welcome. And we look forward to your input from our district employees, our students, our staff, and also for our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Zach, for showing that video for us this morning. I think um, some good background information might be um, the grant funds that the district has received so far and how we've used some of the previous grant funds within the district. And so with that, why don't we pull that one up? Zach and um, Scott, would you walk us through that? You bet. Of course. Good morning, everyone. What's in front of you here? Yes, good morning, everyone. What's in front of you here is a schedule of the COVID grants that we've received. And 
we have been awarded six grants with a potential for one more. So Zach, if you go to page two for me, the ARP funds are down toward the bottom. There we go. They're down for the bottom and at the, if you go across, you can see the award amount, the 14.2 million. I mean, this grant will run through fiscal year 22, 23, and 24. So we have to have all of the funds obligated by September 30th of 2024 with the final run out in December of 2024. And since we don't have a spending plan, what we've done is put down the allowable expenses on the left-hand side. So Zach, if you could um, scroll me down at least one, one more, one more page. There you go. So these are the, the points from the, um, that coincide with the allowable cost that Stephanie talked about as well. And when the spending plan is put together, these will be the components and the dollar amounts of um, what goes into that spending plan. I think one thing that's really important is that um, that document right there, we're going to have that posted on our district website so that anybody can go in and take a look at where we've um, had the expenditures before uh, in case they want to see how much we've got left and if they have any other ideas for those funds as well. But, you know, we've also put in for some other grants that are not only ARP, but some other grants that are coming through as part of the CARES money. Linda, do you want to talk about some of those? Sure, Kelly. Um, we have had the opportunity to write for <clears throat> some competitive grants that the state has had for ESSER funds as well. One of them um, has been what is called the Social Emotional Learning Grant, which we submitted um, last week. And this will encompass um, adding supports for both staff and students for um, mental health and wellness by providing additional um, classes, uh, opportunities for students, and materials that the counselors can use. We have also um, applied for and received a grant for virtual learning. We are also waiting to hear back on a couple other grants, but we've also received some additional competitive grants for um, the McKinney-Vento grant for students in transition that lend themselves all to the things and support things that the district is moving forward with and help with um, the ARP, help with us with ARP funding as well. Perfect, thanks Linda. You know, one of the things that's really important on that, that document <coughs> that we've used with previous funds is uh, the beginning of a Sweetwater School District number one virtual school. And I know we've got Jody here with us this morning. Jody, if you wanna talk a little bit about our virtual school, uh, getting that up and running this year, how that's going, how many kids we're serving at this time. Um, good information for our viewers to know. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We've been so excited to be able to start the Sweetwater Virtual School K through 12 opportunity for the students and families of Sweetwater One. We have a um, K through six. We have uh, a staff of full-time teachers that teach. They are located at North Park Elementary School, but they teach virtually all day long. And we are excited to be able to provide that opportunity for the elementary students this year. We also have a, a strong staff of classroom teachers who are receiving a stipend to provide um, the, um, let's see, seven through 12 teach uh, students asynchronous learning in all the subject areas that students would need to be able to graduate from Rock Springs High School and 
Sweetwater Virtual School. We have uh, about 100 students currently enrolled in our Sweetwater Virtual School number one. So we have been very excited about that. Our, te our secondary teachers receive a stipend that was provided through our federal funds and, and our uh, SR2 grant. And so they receive money to teach asynchronously beyond their school day. And it's it's been going great. We, we are so excited. Our teachers are enjoying being able to provide the opportunity. In fact, this week, if you are a parent of a, of a virtual student, we are having open house Tuesday night from six to seven will be our elementary open house here in the boardroom. So if you would like to come and, and uh, see your teacher in person, we would love to have you. And then on Thursday night, it is our open house for our secondary virtual students. And so from six to seven on Thursday night. So our teachers would love to see their students in person. If you're not able to make it, we will also log in digitally. So we would love for you to be able to interact with your teacher this week. So I think that's it. Thanks, Jody. We appreciate that. Oh, perfect. Uh, looks like on um, the YouTube in the sideboard, we have a, a question and a comment on there. I think that's good information to share. Uh, first part, it's too blurry to read. If this money does come in, are we going to reopen the schools that we closed so our class sizes aren't so large in the schools that are affected? Uh, Stephanie replied on there and she said you can find the link for this um, underneath the November board agenda items. We're going to actually get this document up there too on the district website on the, on the homepage so that people can click right there and you'll be able to see that as well. Uh, so that's the first part. We appreciate that feedback. Thank you. We'll get that clear for everybody to be able to see. Uh, the other part about opening um, the schools, and I don't know, Chair Jellico or Mickelson, Mr. Mickelson, if you would like to add anything, but um, the thing about closing the schools is this is one-time money that we use, and actually the enrollments of those schools are not at capacity, and the class sizes fall right in line with district policy as well. So for our uh, kindergarten through third grade, we're at 23 or lower. And 4th through 12th, we're at um, 27 or lower in those classes. And so um, for the use of funds, uh, it's got to be something that we can sustain. And if we open up those schools again and the enrollment is not there, then we're back to where we started, unfortunately, for, for last year. But... Um, Chair Jellico, I don't know if you'd like to add anything else or yeah, Mr. Mickelson. I would just like to remind everyone the reason that we did close schools is to become more efficient. Um, we had classrooms where there were fewer fewer students and others that were had larger students, kind of depend larger number of students depending on what part of the community we were in. But under the funding under the funding uh, system that we have with the state of Wyoming, we were limited in the amount of money that we were getting and. So we had, to, we had to run more efficiently, and that was the whole purpose of, of consolidating the schools. As Superintendent McGovern has said, this is one-time money. It is not meant to sustain anything, so when it's gone, it's gone. And so in order to open classrooms, my, my forecast would be we'd have to see a substantial increase in the number of students enrolled in the district in order to warrant opening those opening another school, especially at the elementary level. So, um, so Trustee Mickelson, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I think our community would really wants to know those kind of things. That's a, that's a good part. Yeah, go ahead. One thing to add, sorry, I thought I hit it the first time. One thing to add with this substantial amount of change that had to occur due to the drop in enrollment and the funding is even with restructuring the schools, our schools are not um, even close to being at capacity. 
it's a little scary. We're hoping to see enrollment increase more. Thanks, Nicole. We appreciate that. Um, moving on down, I know Scott was talking a little bit about uh, some of the use of funds that we've had with some of our CARES money before. Uh, we've actually hired on additional custodial staff to make sure that our buildings have that extra layer of cleaning in there. Um, Jody's talked a lot about our virtual school so we can get that up and going. Uh, without the use of those grant funds, we wouldn't be able to do that. So uh, they've been very beneficial for us. Uh, Stephanie, for technology, maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the technology pieces that we've done. Um, maybe the swivel cameras a little bit, but I think some of the things that people might not realize, like the jet packs and different things like that to really support our, our teachers, the use of Jabber, those kind of things would be good. Sure, absolutely. I, I'm good, right? Yep, I'm good. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. I wanted to update really quick and let you know that we did add the spreadsheet link to our website. So it's the fourth link on the website, on the web page now, Kelly, the ESSER spreadsheet that Scott went over. As far as technology goes, um, I really feel like we have been a very fortunate district. We were lucky in that, or just good planning. I don't know. We were really lucky that when the pandemic hit, we had actually gone one-to-one -one that year with our 7 through 12 students already taking devices home. We had also already been one-to-one -one with our K through sixth graders having devices assigned to them. So I'll never forget the day that we had parents drive through and pick up all of the technology that kids needed to, in order to be able to stay home for that last half of that school year when the pandemic hit. We have been very lucky to use the ESSER funds um, to purchase swivel cameras for our teachers. That gave us the ability last year for teachers to be able to teach in their classroom and record and even broadcast lessons as they were teaching them to share with students who may have been maybe in quarantine or even just sick at home. Um, we still have folks doing that. The nice thing about this year is they don't have to do that live uh, feed to the students at home. They can just record their lessons and send links to kiddos so they can they can sign in and do their homework when they're feeling well or when they have the opportunity to do it from home. Um, we have also been providing families with jet packs for internet access at home if students do indeed qualify for free and reduced lunches. Um, we've been able to help them through the process of getting a jet pack assigned and set up. Those have all been paid for through grant funds, and we were actually able to qualify for some E-rate funds for this coming year to help us assist with paying the monthly fee on the Verizon jet packs. Um, we, do, we have done some computer replacements through some of the ESSER funds just to make sure we have everything that we need for all of our students. Um, if anybody needs assistance, internet assistance, you can jump on our website and, and see the link with all of the information there. It's getting further down the list with all of the stuff going on for sure. Um, but we have our internet assistance form there that kind of outlines the process in order to get some help if you need help at home. Did I miss anything? I feel like I did. I don't, I don't think so. Okay. We've, looking back on it, it Gosh, it seems like it's just been kind of a blur on how much is going on. But I think while we're there, it's really important to remember how we started for all of this. I know we're very fortunate we've had in-person in instruction for quite some time now, but the effort of really what that that takes to make that happen. I know the, the work that our teachers and our staff are doing right now um, as we transition our our school district here to a different calendar and how those things work. But but not only that, what they're doing every day to make sure um, as we work through this, our, our staff has done such a commendable job and that extends to everyone, including our transportation staff, our nutrition services. I remember when we were actually closed and they were out delivering food and setting up meals and getting those ready to go and getting technology out for our families and our IT ta staff, supporting people on how to use the technology and our parents at home, just what that really involved to keep that going. We appreciate that. And every day that we have in, in school is, is a big deal. We have schools across the United States that some of them are 
hybrids. They do part online, part in person. And so what we've been doing is really a, a big deal. And we're really fortunate to be able to do some of those things. So Kelly, I just, I just want to take a quick moment. Sorry, Zach, that's why I was unmuted. Just wanted to take a quick moment for some of the folks who may be just joining us. Please feel welcome to jump on to YouTube and put comments in. We have several of us up here keeping an eye on the comments so that we can address those um, out loud to everybody who's watching. So if you have any questions or ideas or anything you'd like to say, just feel free to add it to the YouTube comments and we'll keep an eye on that. You know, one of the things um, that would be good information for our community to know, I think, is uh, how we're trying to take care of all kids. And uh, Casey, we'll transition over to you here in, in just a sec to share about our special services kids and things that we're doing to help them and ideas for the ARP money. But we've also set up two different task forces to make sure we get a lot of input from our parents and our community, our business members, our teachers. And one of them was the Smart Start Task Force, but we expanded that uh, so that we could invite as many people uh, that were interested so that they could join us. And the other was the Parent Involvement for Student Achievement Task Force. And in both of those groups, I would say we've had roughly about 80 people um, that were initially interested in that. Um, some of them, you know, schedules, it's really busy for everybody. We totally understand, but... The input that we've gotten from there has just been huge to try to make this better for everybody and everybody has a voice for it. So with those two task forces, we had students on those as well. And, and that's the best part is hearing from our kids what they would like to see in their school from day to day, especially as we come out of this. We know a lot of our kids haven't had a regular school year um, since they started. So our second graders, you know, right now, their kindergarten and first grade and second grade, they, they don't know what that's really like to have a regular day of school. Our junior high kids that are in ninth grade, you know, junior high was completely a blur. It was a very different type of junior high for them. So those are just some examples of things that we've had, the effect on our kids, on our staff. But And so using these funds to really do what's right for them so that we can get everything back on track and keep our doors open is really important. But with that, Casey, I'm going to turn that over to you and you can share with us some things for special services. Good morning, everyone. It's on. It's on. Oh. Me. Um, we know that, you know, during COVID, we had a lot of students affected through what was going on, you know, shutting down. We know that a lot of students didn't do well under COVID due to the virtual learning. So that was a tough um, thing for all of us to adjust to, but um, more, more importantly, it was hard for them. So with this um, ARP funding and everything, um, special education is looking at some more professional development opportunities for staff when um, it comes to virtual learning, things like that. Um, we're looking at providing compensatory services to some students that you know we still need to provide some um, instructional pieces for the time that they have missed. Um, another important thing has been that virtual piece. You know, we have um, also provided some virtual learning opportunities for students where we have hired some teachers that are certified special ed teachers because some students did do well. They do do well with that virtual piece, um, especially those that have the anxiety, some depression, um, and don't really relate to some stressful activities. Um, so that has been a benefit for some of those students. So we want to continue to provide that. So we also have been doing some virtual learning as well so they meet with teachers you know weekly for their services so we'll continue to do that um, but more importantly I think the mental health piece and how we provide some mental health supports to students within Sweetwater One so what are some things that we can do to provide that for them whether it's you know some outside guidance um, some training within the classroom for some teachers um, but also some training opportunities for our teachers. We know this has been stressful for them as well, but what can we do to support them within the classroom? Thank you, Casey, for sharing that with us. You know, Steph, I was thinking um, on that form, Zach, if we could pull that back up, there's 
those 16 categories that are on there. And um, if you wouldn't mind, Steph, just walking us through what some of those categories are so that if, I know we've got it posted, but if we um, went through and just highlighted each little part, I think that would spark, you know, some ideas about what's allowed under this grant, the possible use of the funds. I think that would be good information for our community to have. Awesome. I'm going to bring it up really quick here on my computer just because my eyes definitely are not what they used to be. <clears throat> if you walk through and look at some of the ideas or some of the, the things that we can do with these funds, some of them are really related to a lot of the keeping, keeping items cleaned. Sorry. There we go. I know you tried, Zach. You zoomed it in really good for me. I appreciate that. So a lot as we worked through, I was actually part, I was lucky enough to be part of both the PISA, um, the PISA group that came back together for the funds and also the re-entry Smart Start um, group that came together to kind of go through what we're already doing <clears throat> as far as how we're keeping our buildings open. Um, a lot of this applies to the how do we keep our building clean? How do we keep it safe? But I think the really big focus, I think as a district, we've done an excellent job of keeping our buildings safe, keeping our buildings open, keeping our building, our students in school. So I think it's really important that we start looking at that learning loss. You know, as Kelly talked about with our second graders, I have a granddaughter who's actually a second grader and she's never had a normal year of school. And you can kind of see the impact that that has on them emotionally and, and mentally and then also educationally. So if you look through, there's a big focus on some of our unique needs of the low-income students or children with disabilities. I know Casey touched on that a lot. I know Linda is thinking constantly of our English learners and how, what we can do to help them. Um, training and professional development on all of our staff, purchasing supplies in order to keep the buildings clean, uh, purchasing educational technology, I think a big one that I have seen come up in so many of our meetings is um, the mental health services and supports. I think that, and I, I'm sure you probably have noticed it, Kelly, or the rest of you up here agree with me, that that's such a huge piece to make sure that our kids are taken care of mentally and emotionally. So that comes up a lot. I know our counselors work tirelessly to take care of our students. There's just a lot going on out there right now. Um, Number 13, you'll see that there's actually some school facility repair and improvements. So this could be a really good opportunity to address some of the issues in our buildings that maybe we haven't had the funds to do in the past. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> how do we keep everybody open? How do we keep everybody in school? And how do we make sure that we're doing absolutely what is best for all of our students so that this does not have the long-term impacts that I think many people are afraid of? Thanks, Steph. I think when you take a look at some of those allowable uh, expenditures, Zach, if we could go back up to uh, number two on that list, that one kind of sums it up. If there's, if we receive a proposal or feedback and there's ever a question about, you know, is that a, an allowable expense? Is it something doable for the district? We'll always verify that with the Wyoming Department of Education before we move forward with that. But I think on number two there, a good way to think about that is really activities that prevent, prepare, and respond to the coronavirus. That's kind of the catch-all for these use of funds. But I think one thing that's really important is if you want to know what our students need, you've got to ask our kids. If you want to know what teachers need in the classroom, you need to ask our, our teachers and our staff. And the same kind of thing, our number three talks about our principals and our school leaders. What do they need for their school? And that's why we're having this forum this morning is if you want to know what our community needs um, or what they would like to see in their schools, you've got to make sure you put yourself out there and you ask the community for, for what they, they need moving forward. We know we've got a good plan that, you know, when we had to go online solely, we don't want to do that, but we had a plan and it worked well. Uh, but we want to make sure we move forward with that. One of the things they talk about too 
is um, about air quality. And just a, an important point to put out there is all the work that our facilities department has done uh, with Dan Celleroli and Mark Bertillo, Terry Bernadis, and, and all of their crew in making sure our facilities have that state-of-the-art um, air quality that is research-based. That's really important to keep our schools open. We've, we've done a great job with that. Um, but I also think it, we've mentioned it a little bit about the mental health services and supports. Zach, that's number 10 on there, taking a look. Um, that one little phrase right there is really, like Stephanie said, it's coming up a lot and taking care of our kids and also our, our staff. You know, our teachers are, are really taking great care of our kids. We've all been affected by this with maybe family members, friends, extended family. And um, our teachers are, they take care of our kids and uh, we got to make sure that we're taking care of them too. And all the rest of the employees that were affected by this every day were the front lines for our kids as well as our parents at home. So just making sure we're doing what we can within that number 10. Any ideas out there would be wonderful. Uh, making sure that we meet the needs of, of everybody as we work through. It's all about the relationships. So if there's ideas on how to strengthen those, we'll definitely want to do that. Chair Jellico, any comments or ideas, any thoughts at this point here? We're we're down to like oh probably our last 15 minutes at most. So mm -hmm. I would just like to emphasize our concern about the mental health and wellness of, of our students, our staff, our families. Uh, we know that this pandemic has gone on way longer than anybody ever imagined it would be. It's not finished yet. Um, and uh, we continue to have um, the disease in our community and it's still affecting us. So um, I don't know that there's anybody that can say honestly that they've not been touched in some way with, uh, with this pandemic. So um, again, we're asking for uh, suggestions, proposals. I mean, don't think that you, you have to have this proposal all timed out, all figured out. If you have an idea, please, please let us know. We have people that can help support and, and maybe work through it. Um, if, if given some ideas and things like that, it doesn't have to be set in stone what, what you're proposing, but if you have an idea that you think would help us help our students better, help our staff better, you know, help our community to heal from this, from this, uh, pandemic, we'd be very interested in hearing that. I, I just wanted to jump in and take just a couple seconds to say I'm, when people see proposal and they see upload a document, we actually discussed and went back and forth. Do we set up a template? Do we look for anything super specific as we're requesting proposals for how to use these funds? And I think the decision was unanimous to just leave it wide open. We we want every idea, we want every possibility that you can think of that that we can use to build these relationships with our kids and do what's best for our students. We want innovative ideas. So if we if there's too much to fill out and complete, sometimes it it stops the ideas from flowing. You know, Jody, one of the things um, Linda and I we were just thinking of a little bit is about the multi-tier system of supports and a plan for interventions. What are your thoughts coming from our curriculum office as we move forward? What we're working on this year, uh, people that we've had come in to kind of lay the groundwork, but how our teams use their, their time, all that kind of stuff for this year, that might spark some ideas too. All right. Well, we've been very fortunate this year. We were able to kind of kick off uh, some of our work within the buildings by inviting a partnership with Solution Tree. Solution Tree sent two great speakers, um, Tim Brown, who was a retired principal and superintendent, and he talked a lot about the importance of intervention and setting up a, a response to intervention model in a, in your school, an RTI model or MTSS. And then we were fortunate to have 
Troy Gobble come about mm, three weeks later, and he is the current principal of Adelaide Stevens High School, and he is a master when it comes to an intervention model. Um, he invited us. They actually, Adelaide Stevens is um, just the core of of uh, intervention work that they have done. And they invited us even in to um, come visit the school and see what they've done and how they have set up an RTI process that has worked so well that um, he shared a lot of information about that. And so we know that our administrators, um, this past year we did a book study with um, solution tree. Every principal had a coach from solution tree that helped their buildings work through the the beginning stages of setting up a good plan. And this year we're moving forward as our principals are also participating in a book study within the leadership team um, on setting up wind time and really trying to find something that works within their building. With our ESSER money, we were able to hire interventionists in every building. Every school has one. Um, the junior high, I think they had funding for two. I'm not sure if they filled both of their positions. And the high school had four positions. And I think we've been able to fill two of those positions. And so our interventionists are able to support the students in whatever direction that the principals have directed the the intervention work to go. And so we've been fortunate to have that as well, separate from our, our um, RTI MTSS model. And so we hope that as moving forward with some of this money, as we look to address learning loss, we might be able to provide additional intervention support as well. So it's, it's definitely a time where we need to make sure that we are providing whatever our students need to catch them up from the learning loss that has happened due to the last two years of, of um, this pandemic. So, so I think that's about it. Thanks, Jody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to add just a little something about staffing. Um, when we've sat in our meetings, I know that the first go-to is to hire more staff, hire more staff, hire more staff. Um, which is a great idea. However, um, we still have so many positions unfilled, partly because of the timing that money was approved and when we were able to post the positions. We're hoping to be able to grab some um, semester graduates. But even the interventionist positions that we have open, because they're grant funded, they are only two-year positions. And so at that point, you're always hoping that something opens up that we can slide people over because those are not sustainable positions. The one thing I would caution is um, really promoting hiring more and more support staff that we're not able to sustain because I think one thing that we do not want to do is, well, I'd love to hire more support staff if we could, you know, to sustain for long periods of time. But if we hire all this support staff, and we get used to things, and then in two years, we have to let them all go, um, and then somehow figure out a way to go back to how we were operating without the support. We have to be very careful with that. I think the biggest thing people need to remember is this money is not sustainable. It is one-time money. So we need to implement and do things to intervene with kids right now, um, and I know that we are trying to fill some interventionist positions, but Beyond that, we have to be very careful with the um, staffing part, and we have to be very creative in some different um, opportunities that we could bring in to teach our kids how to socialize again, to interact with each other, to give them STEM and enrichment, to give them intervention, um, to give them emotional support, looking at our medical side with our nurses um, of how we can support them. So that is, that's just one caution I have, just because um, the more people we hire, if we're not able to sustain it, I feel like the more people we hurt, and it's hard to go back to operating without all that support. Thanks, Nicole. And boy, what a great job have our school nurses done for the last three school years. We couldn't have 
have done any of this without their support too. It's really taken everybody. Uh, the district is really trying to pursue a lot of grant funds uh, in addition to this ARP grant, but also some other grant funds. I know Linda's talked about a couple of them here at the beginning. One of them that would be really important to touch on is the SAMHSA grant. Uh, we haven't spoken about that one a little bit. Linda, you want to walk us through the SAMHSA grant and how long that's for and the uses for those funds. I think that would be very helpful for our community too. Um, <clears throat> I would love to because I'm excited about this grant. It's actually, um, it's a grant that the state has received federal funds for. It is for a five-year period. And what we are, are doing along with the state is establishing a partnership with um, one of the mental health community members and we will be developing rooms in each of the buildings where students can go and receive um, mental health support, counseling support, um, have someone to talk to from the counseling field, and we will be doing it virtually. This support will also be um, provided to parents as well. And the, we will be developing community partnerships along with um, the grant. So the grant is providing a variety of um, ways in which we can help support students who are struggling, who need additional, um, additional supports. If, if I may, uh, I'd like to suggest if some of you out there are thinking, well, you know, what, what can I, what can I propose? What can I, what kind of feedback can I give? It might be helpful to think of it from a selfish standpoint. What does your, what does your student need? What do you as a family need? What uh, staff members, what do you need? And look at it from that perspective, because I can't believe that if, if those are the things that you're seeing, that you're not alone, that other people are seeing those too. And they may not, they, they may not have the means or the thought to, to submit it. So that might be helpful as you think about generating ideas that would provide the feedback that we need to uh, help address our concerns with our students and our staff. That's a great point, Carol, because a lot of times just having those conversations and putting that down on, on paper really sparks another idea, and, and that's all it takes is just an idea to lead into something else and, and then the plan that you come up with. So that's a good thing. It's pretty quiet this morning in our questions on the side. We're not, we're not getting a lot. We know it's a Monday morning, and it is definitely early, so we're getting that ready to go, but... Um, Stephanie, any final thoughts, um, things that have come your way and we'll kind of work our way down the line and we're getting ready to close up. Mr. Mickelson, please. I, sorry, I was just going to suggest that maybe the people who are watching could uh, come back to us tonight if, if the day has given them time to come up with some questions and to reach out to their friends in the community uh, and, and hit us up at tonight's forum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't, I don't really think that I have anything to add. I just strongly encourage you to reach out, give us your ideas. Um, let us know your thoughts. I like uh, Chair Jellicoe's idea about be selfish about it because it's not just your student or your classroom or your building that that's probably experiencing these issues. So we really look forward to getting as much feedback as we possibly can. Please, please don't look at this as, we, you know, we've got this windfall of money and so we, we've got to spend it somewhere. We want to be able to spend it in a way that is going to impact, have the most impact for our students and our staff. And so that's why we're taking the time to, to try to gather input, to get feedback, to have proposals. And again, if, you know, if you've got a thought, it doesn't have to be 
figured out to the last detail. Chances are, if you have a thought, we can we can build or other people can build on it. And we, we want to make this money have an impact and not just a windfall that, you know, the, the feds gave us some money, so we're going to try to figure out a way to spend it. We want to have the most impact for our students and our staff and our community that we can possibly have. And I'll jump in on that, Chair Jellico. Um, thinking selfishly as you're planning throughout the day, um, what does your child need? If your child is one of the students who is struggling due to the effects of this pandemic, what does your child need as far as learning loss goes, as far as emotional supports go? Whatever you can think of, you know, put it out there. Fill out the feedback form. If you don't know how much it would cost, click on feedback, and then you just type your ideas. We are looking at all ideas and seeing what we can use this money to best support our students. Any other final thoughts as we work our way down the line? Any? No? Well, we're down to just our last couple of minutes. I think uh, one thing I'd like to close with is we're entering American Education Week this week. And so uh, our, our schools in the district, our education system, people are working really, really hard to do what's right for kids. So when you see any of the district staff and also to all of our parents and families out there, a huge thank you for supporting our schools, for making these last couple of years be successful and as we move in the future. So anybody that, that you run into that's part of education, including our community, our bus drivers, our custodians, secretaries, our teachers, our cab staff, um, all of those people, nutrition services, everyone that makes things work. We talked about our nurses keeping people healthy. Uh, it takes all of us. So congratulations on American Education Week. And we're going to meet again tonight at 6 o'clock. So if you have other ideas, great. And that online form is on sweetwater1.org. You can click that right from your phone, provide any ideas. All the documents are there. So you can click on those. It's open for you, for everybody to view. Um, and with that, if there's any other comments, we welcome them. But otherwise, we're going to have a great start to our Monday. And we're going to come back together at 6 o'clock tonight. And we'll get this posted on our YouTube channel so anybody can go back and review that. I would just like to say on behalf of the board, we appreciate uh, our community. We we appreciate our students. We appreciate our staff. American Education Week is a, <clears throat> excuse me, a way of showing that. I, you know, um, we've we've had our bumps. You know, we've we know that we've got some learning loss that we need to get caught up on. But if you watch the news or your your source of information, there are some places in the, in the country that still are not in person, or just getting back to in person. So when you think that we have been in person all of last year and this year, that is an accomplishment. And we think that it's, it's, we, ha we have a wonderful staff that is dedicated to their students, and we want to thank them for that during this American Education Week, but to our community as well. It's, it's, a, it's a partnership, and we're only as successful as our community is helping us to be successful. So thank you very much for your time this morning. And if you have ideas, please submit them. Uh, as Max said, uh, if you have things, think of some things during the day and you want to have a chat about that tonight, please rejoin us at 6 o'clock. Um, and thank you very much for, for tuning in this morning. Perfect. Thank you so much. We'll see everybody at 6 o'clock. Have a great day.